Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is um, Anthony. First of all, um, it's a pleasure to meet you, Senator. Uh, my name is Anthony Ogunfabo. I'm a lawyer here in uh, England, in London. And um, in so many ways, I closely identify with Nigeria because I'm as old as Nigeria. So that gives you an indication of my age. And I'm very passionate about the country. Now, the one thing I would say right from the off is that, you know, in my youth, I used to do a bit of boxing. So, Senator, I'm not going to pull any punches. <laughs> um, you see, when one looks at Nigeria as a whole, particularly over the past uh, 20 or so years, almost 20 years of uh, uh, democracy, one sees uh, an almost total lack of political will and serious leadership. And when I say serious leadership, I'm not just talking about people like Fayoshe or Dino Melaye, you know, these people. I'm not, no. What I'm saying is, like, when you look at world history, maybe over the past 50, 100 years, you see certain uh, recurring parameters uh, in relation to uh, countries' development. And uh, I have picked three of those parameters, and my questions will be based on those three parameters. The first parameter that I have seen that a country requires in order to even begin to develop is infrastructure. The reason why I say that is that I know for sure, because I've been to Italy, I've been to Rome, that in 2000 uh, BC, 2000 BC, no, I'm sorry, 2000 years ago, I should say, the Romans had water in Rome. Senators in Rome had water flowing in their houses. They had taps. And I said to myself, how come in Nigeria we cannot do what Romans did 2,000 years ago? For me, that is, that is simply disgraceful. That's the first thing I would say with regards to infrastructure. And following on from there, I'll take the example why I say that I do not believe that uh, uh, Nigerian leaders have the required political will. I, I think they don't even believe in the country. The only person that I respect in that country is not even a politician. He's a businessman, and that's Aliko Dangote. If we had hundreds, in fact, I would say we need a political Aliko Dangote. And I'll tell you why. This is a man who could have put his money in Swiss banks, like a lot of Nigerians, but he's investing billions in that country. That tells me that he believes in it. Because if Nigeria falls apart, all those investments will go to nothing. He will lose billions. That is somebody who's putting his money where his mouth is and saying, in spite of all the infrastructural problems in Nigeria, in spite of all the issues, he believes in the country, he's investing in that country, he's building cement factories, he's building uh, refineries, that tells me that this man is serious and he believes in Nigeria's future. We need politicians who also have a similar belief in Nigeria's future. That's the first question, infrastructure. The second question has got to do with uh, education. I'm happy that you're in the educational sector, you have a, an institution. But Senator, let me ask you this. I have read a study that says that uh, Nigeria has the highest number of out-of-school children in the world, over 10 million. Six million of those children are in northern Nigeria, the al children. I believe that the government can easily do something about that if the political will is there to do it. You don't have al children in Saudi Arabia. That's the birthplace of Islam. And I said to myself, why? Not only the fact that you know, those children are not being trained, are not being given skills for the future, they're cannon fodder for groups like Boko Haram. In fact, I see Boko Haram not as uh, a religious or Islamic problem. It's a social problem. Boko Haram is a social time bomb which has exploded in our faces. And if we're not careful, we'll have more and more explosions like that. 
we need to do something about it for the, not just our future, for the future of our children in Nigeria. The last thing I will talk about is health, or the last question I've got for you is health. Again, Nigeria has one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the world. That is to say, mothers dying in childbirth. And I'm saying to myself, in the 21st century, with all the money that we've got, that should not be, that should not be happening in this day and age. It shouldn't be happening. So, like I said, though I, 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 there are other issues I'd like to discuss, but in view of uh, the time factor, I, I, want, I have to keep it short. And I'm saying to you, Senator, what I believe Nigeria needs are serious leaders with the necessary political will to make that country work. And I think they can, because when it comes to money and inflating contracts and lining their pockets, they always find that political will. But when it comes to addressing these issues, they never do. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will define the meaning of quick. Um, <laughs> that was very quick. So we'll let you answer, and then we'll take the next question. Your questions were actual statement of very, very strong facts. And your facts, all of which I agree with, absolutely. Now, about what I just have to go back, I, I will answer your questions by going right back to what I have been discussing. Because the fundamental building blocks of my economic vision, my leadership strategy and whatever we call it, are issues that have direct bearing and direct impact on all these. Mine is about defining what do you need for good governance. The moment you have good governance, that is the DNA that delivers the infrastructure, the education and the health care. Now what is wrong with the DNA? What is wrong with the DNA? is A, procurement, is faulty. And I'm not good in sciences. I think we have G, T, A, C. Am I right? In the chromosomes. Yes, A, G, T, C. The G, A, T, C, A, G, T, whichever way you put it, four of them. And these form in different series. Now you can just take, for example, in the DNA of good governance, number one is procurement, and it is faulted from one. That's why I use the analogy of a tapeworm that is sucking away 90% of the body's nourishment. And I told you that I want to kill it right from the ego square where it is announced. I also asked, I have never heard any Nigerian leader who during campaign will speak about this. I am saying this now and I keep asking myself, how about those cronies around me who are thinking that they're going to benefit from such contracts? Forget it. This is not. So that should answer your question. Political will and serious minded Nigerians. If you think you're supporting me to go and get an inflated contract or anything like that, forget it. If you're coming with me and you're going into mass housing, for example, and it's legitimate, it's your trade, you're known for that, I will go out of my way to come from London, to come and meet you here. Bring whoever you want to make sure that we get the benefit of your expertise back in Nigeria. And I can support what I've said. So one of the chromosomes, procurement, is faulted and I've told you how to go about it. Two is nepotism and uh, personal group and sectional interest in appointments. You get, the ra you get the wrong people into the wrong offices. You get the right wrong people into the right offices you get the right people into the wrong offices. Again, that's the DNA. It keeps going around. You can never be 100% correct. And I thank our sister for asking me about ladies and everything. 
and you can go through my business career my political career and see how careful I have been in selecting people that work with me and people that work for me it's just take five minutes after this open the website see who the vice chancellor is see who the deputy vice see whoever there there's nothing to hide that's the second chromosome in selection and staffing your government the third chromosome is that of process and bureaucracy and i thank you who asked about decolonization of our educational system that's a very good uh, question we're just going to cut out everything and we're going to do it in a very civilized very civic it is nigeria's problems of today we'll sit down and design our civil service procedures public service pro procedures operations manuals and everything for ourselves last but not the least of course is um, what I'll call the welfare condition of the individual, which is meant made of his education, his health, and his earning. Now, what did I tell you? The principle of living wage. Living wage, one, you stabilize an era, which again I have mentioned. Anything you do without stabilizing the Naira, just stabilize the Naira. And let me deviate, I'll tell you, it is like a science of wit, your currency. The pound sterling, why is it so strong today? Is because the British is so proud to be British, believe me. The British be believes he can do anything to be Brit British. Same thing with the US dollar, they protect it. Add that to other economic factors. But that it falls beyond a certain age, crisis will set in. Now, why is the Naira in such a bad shape? That is because the Nigerian doesn't love the Naira. Our pride our ego, our nationalism, and everything we don't realize, I invested in that currency. But it's a whole uh, hour lecture which I shouldn't go into. So the principle of living wage, get the currency stable by declaring to the whole world that your government is minded to back a demand and supply approach to retaining it where you met it. I'm not going to say that I'm bringing back the Naira to 240 or 120. The way I met it today, I would like to retain it like that. I, can. I didn't make it. The best I can do is to leave it that good or that bad. To come back and find out in the next year it's 600, 700, 750, no not with me. How are you going to do that even if it means depleting your foreign reserves? You will do it. But there's even a more sensible way of doing it yourselves. Yeah, because if I set a system in which you are investing 10, uh, one to 10,000 pounds in Nigeria every day because the return in Nigeria is twice higher than it is here in the UK, simple market forces, demand and supply. You can do that. So that is the third, that is the fourth, uh, what do you call it, genome or chromosome, chromosome of the DNA. To answer your question in totality, the answer is getting good governance. Good governance is made of these four building blocks that I've told you about. With good governance, you're going to solve security. You're going to solve infrastructure, education, and the rest, and the rest, and the rest. But in one sentence, 
what is my leadership strategy? Use quality education and training to build the economy that will solve our security challenges. And this is official, in quote. This is official. But the question now is, how are you going to get good governance? You can be a very good artist, sketch your castle. Here it is, your castle is here, it's beautiful. Now how are you going to get it? Where do you get the land? How are we going to get someone like me, who is ad initio telling everybody that I'm going to end free lunch of inflated contracts? The politicians are not going to be happy to hear this. The party is not going to be happy to hear this. How are you going to sustain our party if you're not giving us contracts? Contracts cannot continue, for God's sake, in Nigeria. The Boko Haram you spoke about, contracts are responsible for it. The food that the army is eating there, contracts are given for it. So there is no need to end it. Because if it ends, who's going to be making, making that? The education that the children were denied before they became enrolled into Boko Haram is because somebody was eating 90% from the inflated contracts for their buildings, for their educational materials, and so on and so forth. You spoke about a school. Now you say you will not send your chicken there. You're lucky there was a school. <laughs> no, no, no. You're lucky there was a school. How about, how about where you go, the money has been spent, okay? The money has been spent on paper, the construction has been done, but the elements have eaten it away. Wind blew it, the roof, then wind blew the walls, then wind blew the floor. And now with rain and grass has grown, it's because the building was so poorly done. Because somebody ate 98%. Instead of building with cement, they build with sand, and they'll be paid. I'm telling you now that there, is a, there are schools where on paper they exist, but now if you go, <laughs> there's nothing to see, so you can't even send your chicken there. <laughs> now, how do, you get, how do you get good leadership? How do you get good governance in Nigeria is what we should be concerned with. And your intelligent questions has taken us round and brought us to why we're sitting here. Why we're sitting here, and yesterday I was telling myself, I was with a serving governor yesterday, who happened to be a classmate of mine, but uh, I visited him yesterday to tell him that he was in a sinking ship. As a friend, I owed him that, let him quit. When he was escorting me, I told him that uh, I have to stay till Wednesday morning because of this and that of tomorrow. And I told him, what an irony. In Nigeria, if you ask anybody, please move this pen from here to here, you have to pay for it. And I told him that these friends, or rather this friend, two months ago I didn't know him. I met him through a senior of mine. And they have been spending their money to come together. They rented the place. They did all the organization. And you know how life is here. Every hour counts. You know, I meet him. I say, so whatever it takes, I will stay the extra two days uh, before I went back. How do we get good governance in Nigeria? This is, for example, a starting point. What my good friend has been doing is a turning point. And the hours that you sacrifice to sit here is a turning point. The intelligent questions that you're asking me and the poor answers that I'm giving you for you to, you know, uh, manage and uh, understand what kind of uh, leader uh, uh, you're trying to create is. The issue ahead of us is not to sit down and talk. Talk is cheap. And you took a serious gamble because you could have had a very smooth talker who would have come here, 
entertain you so much. Maybe if he's that good, even brainwash you to think that there's nobody like him. You know, tell you. But you're so lucky. You got a very poor talker uh, who doesn't know how to convince and, uh, you know, uh, in me. And who will tell you straightforward that, uh, you know, I'm going to take the most infamous decision. I want to, I want to end a word of contracts. I want to, you know, you took a risk. Talk is cheap. People keep asking me questions and questions and questions. Now, I understand your point of view. When one of us here said that there was, there was no um, agenda, that is very, very true. Buhari was just elected because the illiterates in the north hate elite, and they said he's anti-corrupt. While in effect, he's one of the most corrupt leaders in Nigeria. People assumed he was because he locked off people. So I understand your viewpoint that you need to, whatever it is, just talk, touch, feel, see. Who is this guy? Yeah, that is quite legitimate for you to do. But then it would even have been better if you constitute yourselves into like a crack team. Go and do forensic checks from somebody. That is true. Do forensic checks on somebody's past or somebody's present. And with your expertise, project what can this individual do. If you ever rely on what people are saying, you're going to continue to make mistakes and mistakes and mistakes. I'm sorry, I'm a politician. <laughs> Supposedly. <laughs> But I'm telling you that I wouldn't rely on what people say. My name is Michael Okogu. My question is just very brief and simple. When you get to this office, what would be your take on restructuring Nigeria? Restructuring is a legislative affair. And restructuring is more misunderstood than understood. And I have respect for the aspirations of all Nigerian peoples, and I am ready to support any legitimate move to, uh, to amend the Nigerian constitution in any way possible. In effect, what I'm saying, according to the Nigerian constitution, the president does not have power to amend the constitution. It's a legislative affair. Why people keep saying uh, restructuring and the presidency and restructuring it is a misplaced, it's not the work of a president to amend the constitution. You can influence it, and if I see a genuine move, I surely will support. Uh, yes, Your Excellency, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to um, put our questions to you. We very much appreciate that. Those of us in the diaspora don't always get this opportunity. So yeah, we appreciate that very much. Um, my question is around um, uh, yourself as a northerner. Um, looking to address this issue of security in Nigeria, um, given that most of the insecurity is in the north. How, how do you propose to tackle this issue of security without appearing to be partisan or appearing not to maybe support your people in the north, etc.? How do you propose to be a president of the people, the pre a president of the whole of Nigeria, a president who cares about the security and the safety of the whole of Nigeria? Well, sometimes I have to be reminded that I'm a northerner, because I really don't see in effect myself. It's when you have to fill the form and they ask you which state are you from state and state of origin. I have to be reminded that I'm a, a, a northerner. And it's, you know, it's the system which, which makes now, point of correction, the security issue, for example, what happens out of insecurity? How does it happen? Somebody kills somebody. That is a federal offense. It's not a northern offense. <laughs> it's not a southern offense. And um, organizations that have been termed terror organizations, okay? Uh, terms are so done by the federal government using the federal 
uh, institutions, namely the DSS, and seeking the court's permission to, and these courts are also federal in nature. However, let me tell you, um, in as much as I don't like to segregate national issues, but it does not, insecurity happens through a mechanism from the import of uh, weaponry from the south through our poros, through the ports and, uh, you know, all the way through the roads uh, with complicity from with the agencies that allow uh, weapons to sift through. Even before the crash of Libya, when Gaddafi's weapons began to flow uh, in, in the Sahel region, the standard way of importing weapons to Nigeria was from the south. And uh, you know when the oil pipelines were being vandalized, that is vandalism, it's not terror. Quite okay, but it's a security issue. So I plead with you, I plead with you to see insecurity anywhere in Nigeria as insecurity as everywhere in Nigeria. I used to say, uh, there was a time when one of uh, Jonathan's ministers, you know, casually said that, no, 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 it's there in the northeast. He was his hands it's somewhere out there in the northeast. And uh, before I even made my comments, it was in the public uh, lecture, at least three other people took to the mic and dressed that minister down, that killing the life of one Nigeria in the farthest place in Nigeria, northeast, wherever it is, is a threat to the life of another Nigerian in the most southern part of Nigeria. Every barrel of crude oil that is spilled away is a loss to a Nigerian everywhere he is. So I beg us, I plead with us to see it as uh, one whole family, one whole family. Uh, it's a Nigerian president that is elected by majority of votes. And that is why the wisdom of the constitution, which says, including 25% in at least two thirds of the states before you are declared a winner. So when you are a president, you are a president of Nigeria, not a northern president, maybe from the northern uh, extraction. The same thing if you are a president from the south. I believe we have been doing very well. Look at the history of Nigeria. Obasanjo handed over to uh, Shagari in 79. Southern are given to a Muslim. Why did he do that? He said because, um, you know, going through history, there was this Tafa Balio who was killed. Okay, what happened? Iran se took over and then Gawan came. Uh, Gawan was thrown over by them Eradu and Murtala and others. Uh, even though Obasanjo didn't want to hold, they said, you are the most senior you become. Irrespect, that, that's when Nigeria was Nigeria. Okay. Uh, elections were held in 1979, he handed over to Shagari. Buhari overthrew Shagari, IBB, and all that. It was successive of succession of the northern ones. When eventually it was going back to civilians, what happened? They said, look, we northern Muslims have had it for 15 years, and this is a family. What do we do? Let Christian brothers from the south hold it. This is truly what happened. And they said, who do we, who are we comfortable with in the, in the south? They said, Obasanjo. Let's, let's keep it. And they gave it to Obasanjo. What happened again? Obasanjo, when he was handing over after eight years, um, this former governor, Odili, he was going to win the primaries in PDP. Yeah. 
he was going to win the primaries in PDP. He's far stronger than Lit Eradwa. Knocked him down completely. Obasanjo came out and said, no, we are going to respect each other. This is a federation, it's a family. We're that's how they forcefully got Eradua elected. Then, you know, when he died, the North again insisted that uh, the, no, 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 the Constitution must be, uh, must be obeyed. It, it didn't matter if Jonathan was minority of minority was or whatsoever. So between 2010 and 2011, we said, please, God Almighty made you be the president. Uh, Jonathan pleaded for one elected, elected term, 2011. He pleaded for it. They said, how can we go and convince people? A Muslim northerner died. And you know by uh, the political arrangement, this and that, this, you know, we keep circulating. And he assured them that it's, it was going to be for only one term. And that it was in the spirit of nationhood to show that he being a minority of a minority was being elected. And, he, you know, I know these people who worked for Jonathan. They went to him, they said, we, it is nearly impossible for us to go back to, for example, a place like conservative Yobe state with those fundamentalists and how they said how can we go and convince these people that even though it's, it's our turn we, we they should vote vote you he pleaded and pleaded and they went and walked and walked and walked and in 2011 they got jonathan elected against who against another muslim only for down the road again jonathan to say no it's not one time it's two times you get the point and that is when they brought Buhari back out of retirement. <laughs> the most infamous, the most unpopular candidate who was already been associated with failure. They said, fine, if you want to play it that way, we'll play it that way. They came back and said, if you think your money, because designer and others have all, if you think money is going to give you, we will assure you, we'll show you that money will not give you. That's what happened in 2015. They just, Buhari, jo Jonathan made Buhari. Correct. Don't, but nobody wants Buhari. We all know he's such a bad leader. But there was no time to go start creating and bring on, it wasn't worth taking the risk. They just wanted to find who has the mass appeal. And they know Buhari, okay, bring him out. That was it. And then hurriedly put everything together. It was a simple referendum against Jonathan. That's how it happened. So please, I beg you. Nigeria is one big family. Um, the president is president of Nigeria of any extraction whatsoever. Guys like me have to be reminded where we're from. Um, and security, or rather insecurity, is insecure. Because when they are killing, they don't make any distinction whatsoever.